time called Asia Center based in ba uh, Bangkok. But I mean, we have connections from my um, graduate studies in Singapore. That's how we knew each other. And uh, we are starting the journalism school, as you are aware. It's, uh, we are having the first batch of undergraduate students from August this year. So this talk on social media, it's kind of very relevant for the school and also for the other centers at the uh, JGU. So that's why we are very, I mean, it's our great honor that uh, James is, uh, has come down from uh, Singapore. And he also, we organized another seminar, the China India uh, Media Forum on Friday, March 10th at the Habitat Center in Delhi. So James was very kind to be on the panel and he spoke about the, um, uh, the China's presence in Southeast Asia. And uh, it was a very good seminar and we were very glad to have uh, James there as well. And today uh, he's kindly agreed to be here to have our presentation on the social media and, uh, in, uh, in Malaysia. So I would leave it on uh, to James now. Okay, thank you. Uh, happy to be here and you know, new friends, old friends, more new friends, uh, happy holy and all of that. So. <laughs> Uh, John, John was very pink yesterday when I saw him full of colors, but now he, he's much better. <laughs> much better now. Uh, yeah, I, it's not so much a presentation and just a conversation, you know, about uh, Southeast Asia mainly. You know, I'll just use Malaysia as a hook. So I want to try to start off by just um, showing you a video about, you know, uh, uh, e elections in Malaysia. Um, be predominantly Malay. Uh, the Malay ethnic group is also, you know, um, close to 60% now. Those who are not sort of uniformed in blue are the ethnic Chinese um, immigrants, you know, uh, who have, you know, been in Malaysia one, two, three generations possibly. And a lot of the tension you can see, you know, uh, this is outside a polling station, right? So. You gotta watch for it. Yeah, it will emerge slowly. Yeah. yeah it, it's it's still not as good as you see, but um, take my word for it that you know it, it, it escalates. It escalates, and you know there are scuffles, and you know, and you will see you see an undercurrent of ethnic tension. You know. A lot of the instigation actually is started by the ruling party thugs. So what I'm trying to suggest uh, today in today's discussion is I want to, I want to try and backtrack and make a suggestion to you and to see whether you have an opinion on it uh, that a lot of the social media campaigning and you know negative campaigning leads to kind of a polarized radicalization. And many commentators who are watching Malaysia and also other parts of Southeast Asia, and I want to raise a question to many of us who know India or watch Indian elections, to see if there's some kind of correlation. You know, also here, that you know there is the rise of echo chambers, radicalization of emotion online, and then translating offline. Uh, it's very difficult to prove, prove the correlation, but most commentators even legislation that comes out of these things make that assumption. So here I just want to kind of share with you the, the social media journey of Malaysia's election and see if we can make sense to, to other things that we observe. So the last Malaysian election was held in 2013. Um, I was at the University of Uttara Malaysia in Malaysia, so I was embedded there for a year. I saw the elections, you know, in a public university, in a Malay dominated university, I saw it front line. I saw all the campaigning, I read the stuff. Um, and, you know, and I want to suggest that, you know, I had a good vantage point from which to, to share with you a report on uh, what happened uh, <coughs> during the elections. Um, a few things. You know, um, like everywhere else, you know, Malaysia is also facing the same thing, drop in newspaper circulation rate, rise in internet penetration, rise in alternative media, rise in social media. This is how it looks like if you are interested in numbers. 
So you can see on the far right is 2012, three years down. Uh, you know, there's a significant drop of nearly 35 to 40 percent. Uh, if you look at the Malay language newspaper, which is the, the one right at the top, English, you know, maybe about 20 percent. And it continues to slide further. So again, consistent with many jurisdictions in terms of how, uh, print media. Uh, the Tamil newspaper, you know, that's a little bit different because it's uh, explained by the rise in the number of migrant workers from Tamil Nadu who, who consume uh, this publication. So some of it, it's, it's, the Singapore stats are also similar. The Tamil newspapers in Singapore also have seen a slight surge because of migrant workers. Yeah. So, population, internet uh, penetration in 2013, population of nearly 30,000, 20,000, you know, on the net, voters 13,000, and then the projections, so you can see it continues to, to rise and is predicted to rise. So, uh, in excess, the next elections are scheduled in this year, because, you know, all we hear about Malaysia is not... Uh, North Korea, uh, but also the economy is in a crisis. Uh, so uh, that's why uh, there'll be elections this year. So so this you know also is a bit timely. People claim that uh, in a place like Malaysia, where most of the mainstream media are owned by members of the ruling party, so the ruling party, you know, the government. Uh, has a coalition of three big ethnic parties, they own the newspapers. So often people make the claim, therefore, uh, people go to alternative media websites. And I want to point to you to the two last ones, Malaysia Kini and the Malaysian Insider, which is now closed. Uh, you see, even for them, the alternative uh, websites, the number of visitors is also dropping because less and less people are going online. To websites to consume so this is an interesting trend so i want to raise that if you are looking at india or some other jurisdiction do you see that if you make the claim that oh this is a hegemonic media regime and therefore everybody is rushing to alternative media mm -hmm. uh, is that really i think in the early days it was correct but now you can see the stats show something else so yeah yeah even for the mainstream uh like the, the top three you know, these are mainstream newspapers that are online, but even they also, so it's across the board without discrimination that, you know, online readership is also dropping. So, so, so where, where, where is the news coming from, right? So I want to suggest here, it's user-generated content, and during elections, it's more negative, and, and let's see what that looks like. So this is the social media statistics, uh, to remind you that in 2013, the population was close to 30,000, uh, voters were 13,000. Uh, of course, a lot of young people are uh, uh, on Facebook, uh, so there's that uh, skewing as well. But, but just an impression about uh, how, much pe uh, how much people are on Facebook and Twitter. Twitter is still thin, so most of the stuff, you know, so if you want to do a study on social media in places like Southeast Asia, Facebook is mostly it. You know, Twitter is not that significant. Some snapshots. So uh, I want to point you to the pie chart there. So then you can see uh, the user who, who, so male writers, you know, 75% male writers, female writers, 26%. So you, 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 you have that. Um, You have, you know, like during the elections, the number of uh, uh, Twitter posts are quite high, you know. So this is just some uh, uh, first impression, yeah. Uh, this was taken, this is a snapshot taken on election day, 5th of May. Okay, so I'll just move on, this just, okay. So if you want to look at Malaysia or any other country, um, you want to sort of track the history in, in terms of, you know, and here we are talking about the use of, social media during elections. The election previously to the last one was in uh, 2008. That was five years previously. Uh, 
main uh, the ruling party dominated the mainstream print media and, and it was using it for negative campaigning the opposition and this is the history of the southeast asian landscape uh, the sitting regimes always dominate the mainstream media the opposition come online and they had some advantage in the early days so they tried to counterbalance the narrative by putting up their message online so for the opposition in the early days social media was kind of a leveler but is it still the, the case and i will I'll try to argue that it's no longer the case you, you know because the ruling regimes have caught up across the region um, the observations we can see that and again it can be repeated elsewhere is it's an in-group discussion so basically the term they use in social media and, this, uh, and other things echo chambers so you speak to your own kind and if you come into the group and you say something bad about the group you you get banned <laughs> or removed or blocked you know so we know all of that right so uh, therefore the like-minded people talk to each other within the same you know social media domain and that that is what is evidence in the Malaysian case and it's also elsewhere um, I can share experience from Singapore I stood for two elections in Singapore and campaigned on social media and it's the same right the social media is an echo chamber um, so because it's an echo chamber the values and opinions of those in that domain become hardened and polarized and some some of the literature even say radicalized uh, we are unable to show the direct correlation but people assume there's a correlation by you know sort of just linking the offline violence to that kind of uh, you know rhetoric so what are the things that you know gets people upset online so is these kinds of messages so these are user generated content some you know it, it's also expensive to get ad on newspapers and things like that so it's viral you know um, I'm in university administration when I want to recruit students like you would in your school of communication and here's a tip there's only so much students you're gonna get from your ad in the print media right it's social media you got to you know do social media advertising get up to the right. kids make sure you have the right tag words um, don't be a funny daddy make sure you hit all the entertainment um, you know, social media sites because that's right. where your catchment area is yeah right so it's the same for them so they put it up all on uh, social media so uh, just on the left so this is the ruling party saying bad things about the opposition they are saying on the left you elect them they're going to spend money giving you know senior citizens bonuses blah 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 and you, they're going to make the country bankrupt because the the opposition you know wanted to sort of increase welfare payouts and look after all the citizens and things like that. so they say oh this is not a good idea of making bankrupt. on the on the right um, um, the the claim here is the ruling party uh, is using Bangladesh immigrants as ghost voters. This was a big issue. And it's also an increasing issue in Thailand, uh, even in Singapore. Uh, although in Singapore, you know, um, the claim is they give new citizenships easily. So new citizens tend to be grateful to the regime that gives them the ticket mm -hmm. so people tend to vote so so that's also interesting in Southeast Asia that you know the, the assumption that only citizens who live and uh, brought up there would vote for you is changing because new citizens are coming in and they, they are voting and they are you know uh, making political change uh, quite challenging because your base keeps changing all the time so there on the right I think the key word is you know Bangla which they, is kind of uh, colloquial for uh, people from Bangladesh also from West Bengal oh okay so so that's the Malaysia uh, experience and again uh, an, another one they, they accuse the opposition of you know credit card party right pay now 
uh, I mean, spend now, buy now, pay later, right? So they don't have good economic policies and, you know, uh, businesses and relations will go bankrupt, lose jobs and things like that. So these kinds of messages are what are pushed through um, the social media handles. Each party has different types of social media handles. It has a party level. It has a fan club level. It also has individual politicians, star politicians, you know, who push out all these kinds of messages. Um, and also they play the race card. Um, they say, the D, if you look on the right, uh, you see DAP. DAP is the Democratic Action Party, a, a Chinese-based party. PAS is another party uh, that's Islamic that wants to uh, introduce hudud laws. And uh, so they, they, this is a scare tactic against the Chinese voters because the Chinese voters would vote for the DAP. But they are trying to point out, okay, if you vote for the DAP, then pass the Muslim party is DAP's ally. So you're also voting for put it lost, and that's going to be a problem for you. So this kind of, and this is put up in the newspaper. These are newspaper ads. Uh, I discussed this in the paper that the opposition is unable to get space, you know, uh, in newspaper ads, even though they are willing to spend. So that, that's that kind of censorship. So this is the opposition's um, message. Something is kind of a gangster. It's a Malay word for gangster. So uh, they say, I'm no something. So the video I was trying to show you would capture the rowdiness of the ruling party supporters, you know, who are uniformed in blue. They always move in groups with their helmets on. They come in you know, large troops of motorbike gangs. And, and they, they actually go into Chinese voting areas and create tension. So the full video, which is about seven or eight minutes that I was trying to show you earlier, you, you actually see them standing at the side and slowly they inch their way into the heart of the Chinese group and they start shouting and suddenly tempers flare and you know, a bit of pushing and then it escalates to you know, uh, blows and uh, people you know, bleeding and helmets being smashed and, you know, and the police just stand aside and don't do anything, right? So when you actually see the video, you know, you can feel the heartbeat there and it's very tense. And I've seen it on the ground during the 2013 um, election campaign. So again, this is um, BN is Barisan National, the ruling coalition, attempting to sneak in Bangladesh voters using, you know, Barisan National. So these are the messages that go out. The one on the right, it says, uh, okay, look, these are the Amno crowd, you know, again, the blue uh, umbrella, and they are celebrating a rise in petrol prices, you know, so kind of being sarcastic. And, and they push all this message down and, and then people get upset and, you know, uh, raises the adrenaline online. Uh, here, I, I just try to, you know, summarize evidence of political violence. There are different studies that have been done, um, uh, NGO studies, um, some academic studies, observations, but here is mostly election watch reports uh, that have, you know, um, um, listed, um, you know, incidences, uh, publicly known incidences of skirmishes, violence, misconduct, and so on. And, you know, from there you can count evidence of violence, you know, on the ground. And, and also videos, there's something videos that I mentioned right at the end. So these are another set of data. Um, I'll see if this works. So this is uh, a, a, another uh, group of the uh, Barisa National uh, Ruling Party supporters. Uh, loads of kids, you know, ramming up the bike and, you know, uh, driving past, uh, you know, uh, supporters, and then suddenly, you know, somebody hits out at one of the riders, the bike drops, and then the whole range of bikes collapse, and then, you know, things get heated up, and then there's a skirmish. So that's this video. Um, this is the one I was trying to show you right up front. Again, you know, it was outside a polling booth, and again, it kind of tend to be a Malay, Chinese kind of tension. Would it work? Um, let me try again. 
It's not loading because I think it, 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 it connects directly to the internet. Yeah. But let me see if, if the other one still would load up. Those are screams in Chinese language. So you observe the police, they are indifferent. Chairs, helmets. Yeah, yeah, they, they, because the Chinese community feel aggrieved. Usually, they tend to be the victims of this violence. Yeah. And this is still a kind of a softer version, yeah? The harder versions, yeah. Police just minding traffic, right? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Now, this is three years ago. And such incidents continue to flare up till today. So I'm going to wrap up my talk shortly and I'm going to suggest the next election that's going to be around the corner uh, is going to escalate further. Yeah, you're going to say similar violence and there are no rules in place yet policing measure and I think this is something you will need to look out for not just in Malaysia but I think in elsewhere also in the region. <coughs> My many years of going to Malaysia um, and I still continue to visit it's the tension is much much higher John, John knows the region very well, so, so I'm sure he, he will have something to say, but um, it's different. People live in ghettos. I mean, it's exclusive zone, you know? Yeah. So where are the Indians here? Uh, it's interesting. The Indians, which number about 10%, and they are mostly from the state of Tamil Nadu, they, I think uh, their position is one of extreme uh, minority, mm. so they will go for any side as long as they win. And also within the Tamil community, a fair number of people also convert to Islam for strategic reason. Oh. Yeah, and they are not Islamic names and, and you see them standing uh, with the Malays. More so than the Chinese. Mm. So, so they try to, you know, sort of look after their own interests and, and get, a, get ahead. Uh, they are not very, I mean, as a political group, they are not economically well off, so they don't have that kind of political club. Yeah, so um, yeah, so I'll just sort of go on. Uh, There's just a few more slides left. Mm. In the last election, what was different was both parties were online, so both parties equally engaged in negative campaigning. In the election pre. Previously, the ruling party engaged ne uh, negative campaigning using mainstream media. They were uh, quite weak on you know, social media, because usually the opposition you know, takes advantage and goes on first. But now they caught up. So both were dishing it at each other quite well. And I think the ruling party, because of its resources, actually got an upper hand over the opposition. Yeah. And you know, I mentioned uh, s uh, several times, uh, you know, echo chambers and they tend to take a ethno-religious line you know as you can see visually um, when this happened and and so on uh, and these kinds of incidents continue to sort of you know uh, they are flashpoints you know they erupt so the language of crackdown the, the language of um, legislation 
is articulated often, but so far to date, they have not moved specifically to enact any particular law uh, to deal with this problem. Uh, so, um, you know, negative campaigning, fake news, if you must, is rife uh, in Malaysia, political landscape, and continues to fuel the echo chambers and radicalized behavior. Um, it is also known that both sides, the ruling party, which is more resourced, use cyber troopers, you know, to troll and, you know, add. Uh, I had a student and, you know, I, this is just more anecdote. I had a student who was my RA in Monash, Malaysian student, who came back and during the election worked for a PR agency, you know, whose job was to put postings. It was 500 ringgit per post. Right? Uh, he said, look, I needed the money, you know. And uh, 500 ringgit, maybe that's about uh, 150, 166, I don't know how much rupee that is. Yeah. About uh, 110 US dollars uh, per post. So that's the kind of uh, thing that goes on. Then they, have, you know, uh, they put out messages and so on. So they just get a chunk of money and PR firms just, you know, uh, do that. Um, so you can see the headline that Malaysians have no self-discipline, so, so we regulate social media, says Minister, right? Um, so I continue to track, because the election was over in 2013, I want to kind of, you know, monitor this. So, so I, I keep track on what things uh, goes on, and then in 2015, there were 42 cases that are uh, under investigation. In 2016, 13 individuals were, you know, brought in for questioning, and you know, sites are being blocked. So, so these things continue. Um, uh, religious tension continues to uh, be present. Um, Low Yak Plaza. If you look at bullet point one, it's a very well known, you know, sort of internet, telephone, computers mall with a lot of Chinese uh, vendors and there was an incident that captured online when I think one of the Chinese vendors didn't want to serve a Malay customer because I think he questioned whether he had money to buy the product or something like that then the a whole gang of Malay youths then came in and smashed up the whole plaza captured I mean, it was rioting Right? So that, that kind of communal uh, unrest is still part of Malaysia and you can see the tension. So I want to suggest that it's something to look out for uh, uh, during the next election. So I, 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 I'll, I'll stop there now and you know, we can have a conversation about you know, your opinions and stuff like that. So be careful, you know, don't post anything online when you go to Malaysia <laughs> or if you plan to go to Malaysia. <laughs> Be duly warned. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. So, just wanted to add because you you know where you talked about the Indian comparison. So, from what I gather is that we see similar trends uh, in the Indian social media when it comes to religious violence. Like you know, they would take photographs of like uh, you know somebody of the majority party beating up somebody of the minority and they both post it on the youtube and there are different kinds of reactions to it mm -hmm. and uh, the other thing like when you started the talk you mentioned that you know how in an authoritarian uh, society the when the new media came up like when places like malaysia like Kini, uh, came up it was actually opposing the mainstream government voice but I mean, here in India, we didn't see uh, that ma that that trend was, you know, wasn't that significant in the early 2000s. It was the uh, uh, when the social media now it's come up in a big way, but it's directly people are using Facebook and it's a user generated content that's like you know from the very beginning that is the one that's you know, setting the trend when it comes to an independent voice rather than independent websites, which are there though, but these are you know fringe actors. Can I just add there? Um, see, I was there when Malaysia Kini 
was conceived. I was sitting in the office, you know, and the editors <laughs> even got uh, they are my contemporaries. And so maybe you can say a little bit about Malaysia Kini because we, you know. Well, it, it, it's the early version of Telheka.com. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a Malaysian version. Uh, it was founded by journalists, which is okay. which was interesting, uh, as opposed to be founded by activists with no journalist training. So they try their level best. And they first came out as an alternative voice that made them look, you know, sort of anti-establishment. But then they tried to, you know, follow general journalistic principles by getting the other side of the story. And you know, they're still motivated by that. But of course, the base of support. It, 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 it's different, mm -hmm. so that you know uh, continues, um, you know, uh, in Malaysia. Yeah. One of the significant shifts in sound like kind of sociologic is the position of migrants. I mean, I can remember when I lived in that part of the world mm -hmm. ago, migrants from Indonesia were seen as a threat. I mean, there were always stories in the media about effectively boat people, you know, mm -hmm. people in Indonesia showing up at beaches and just disappearing mm -hmm. because of similarities of language and so on, were not easily spotted. Mm -hmm. But what are you suggesting there's been a huge shift in the status of migrants? They're now seen as kind of political ammunition, as it were? Of the opposition sees them as that. Uh, as dangerous. Uh, uh, because, you see, it's different from Singapore. In Singapore, the Singapore government liberalizes immigration uh, gives out citizenship easily, something like 20,000 every five years. So that's significant, you know, because our voter base is quite small. And I have campaigned, so I've gone on the door to knock. And I know, I can tell you that from ground campaigning, the migrants, new citizens are different, you know. They are there, uh, they're all fairly young, with young families. Um, they think they've got a good deal in Singapore. They're not going to upset it. So they're going to vote on the right side. They will tell you up front very clearly. Uh, in the Malaysia case, and also I want to bring in Thailand as well, these are undocumented. So the state doesn't have... So M Malaysia is a conservative state. If you want to apply legitimately for public res uh, permanent residence, it's almost impossible because the minister has to approve it. right? So therefore, they, there's no mechanism for undocumented people to eventually get some kind or even to come in as documented. Because to, to be a documented worker, you need to be earning minimum 5,500 ringgit to get a work permit. So, so the claim now is the different constituency, and this happens a lot in Sabah, in Sarawak, in uh, Borneo Island, where they give the Filipino uh, migrants the green card, you know, or the ID card so that they can so, but there's no conclusive evidence. I mean, there, there are pictures, there are reports and, and stuff like that, but it's certainly something that has come up. Thailand is the same also, because we have undocumented uh, workers from Cambodia, Myanmar. So there are also claims, you know, of that kind of water fraud. Because it's, you know, it's regularized in Singapore, but it's not so in Thailand and Malaysia. And during elections, there's claim that are instant. And, you know, uh, it's not like, okay, I'll give you a green card, and then, great, you are fixed. No, it's like a temporary green card, you know, I mean, just for the voting, and then you're off. Yeah. So there's that kind of uh, um, tension. Um, sociologically speaking, I think um, even Indonesians are still not very welcome. Uh, uh, but... Indonesians want to come to, to Malaysia, uh, unskilled and even skilled workers. I mean, if you go to the university, the public universities in particular, in every department and faculty, you will have a strong Indonesian showing, right? And they come in, they form their own, own Indonesian, Indonesian mafia in, in public universities in, uh, in Malaysia. So uh, that's interesting. I mean, Malaysia is nationalistic. You know, uh, I spent a year in a public university. Malaysian National Day. Everybody's decked out, right? But only the Malays will be there. You won't see the other communities because they don't feel part of being part of the nation. Right. 
because everything is in the Malay language. You know, there's the religious element, the doa, which is you know used to open the ceremony and things like that. Uh, public university, ninety five percent were all uh, Malays. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, it was interesting. I mean, I, I was from Singapore, uh, the only only one, you know, embedded <laughs> in Malaysia. But I was always tapped on the shoulder. Singapore, okay, good. <laughs> so uh, yeah, but but you know it's nice. You know it's a community. You you they say grace, doa. You know you're just part of it and and, and all of that. Um, so it's nice. I mean when you're kind of inside. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Sir. Yeah, I'm like, you know, how can I take this so coming to Nazareth Jews? I'm also having a center for Southeast Asia studies. Oh, nice, yeah. Uh, I've been to Malaysia a few times, mm -hmm. especially for a month. Mm -hmm. um, I could uh, relate myself to some of the conversation that you had. But I just want to ask a question or maybe a comment. Uh, if you look at uh, comparatively Thailand and Malaysia, for example, you, you probably responded that it's a, a purely nationalistic state. See, when you look at great elections, for example, do they go along ethnic lines or do they go on like uh, issues rather than along ethnic lines or is it re religious lines? For example, if you look at Thailand, uh, see, uh, for the red versus the yellow. Yeah. So some of them would, uh, the red, for example, would go to the, what do you call I mean, the white, the yellows goes, is it the urban, right? Mm. And the red is the more the rural areas. Mm. Is it do? Do they have something issues that divide them, or is it do they go along purely along ethnic lines and religious lines in Malaysia? Okay, I want to uh, bring in one variable for consideration since you are interested in Southeast Asia. I think those who study Southeast Asia and interested to investigate Southeast Asia, especially its politics, I think need to be cognizant and bring to the front the role of the Chinese diaspora and their role in politics. I think without understanding their hegemony in, in politics of Southeast Asia, I think you cannot read Southeast Asian politics sharply. So I mentioned this in a previous forum. For those of us on the ground, we don't see this you know, red and yellow as a Thai political thing. We see it as Thai Chinese elite families competing for each other for power so that they can capture the state and ransack the state for financial gain that's the game so the yellows mm -hmm. marshal the royal family which itself has intermarried within the chinese community you know and the military right the chinese families now you know in the old days if you go to Thailand, right, the military generals and the traffic police, you know, they were all big, burly, and pot bellied and very dark complexion. Now, no. Now these are educated, Harvard educated, slim Thai Chinese types. You know, so, so, so the, the whole power relation, even in the bureaucracy and the military, is changing. And the reds, Thaksin, right? They marshal the indigenous people from Isan, right? So you don't see Thai. Thai doesn't have a kind of a ethnic nationalism led by an indigenous Thai leader because the Thai Chinese will kill him before they even allow him to gain uh, power. He can probably he or she can probably gain political power from the masses, but can't reach the top. So coming back to to, to, to Malaysia, I think the same dynamics apply. Of course, parties in the start, you know, you, 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 there's an election cycle, you know, you start nice, you know, talk about the issues. And then uh, as, you, as you feel the campaign tension and so on, then you up the ante. Then it becomes ethnic, it becomes religious, but it's also fueled by money. I was in the north. Uh, to the uh, near the Thai border, I was in Kedah, and I drove around. Amno has more money, so it's fifty dollars a flat. So I've got a little house with a veranda, right? 
how many flags you got? How much you can give me? So if you give me 20, 250 ringgit, five flags right there. Five blue flags in, in front of my porch. So in the northern state, it was a sea of colors. You know, I mean, when you drive up the highway, the back roads, full of blue. No, you know, I'm not was just spending money. You could hardly see uh, the the opposition. But Malaysian politics is a contestation for Malay votes because they are the number sixty percent. So if you if you can't, if the Malays decided they don't want political change, it won't happen because the Chinese won't swing it. Twenty five, twenty six percent. Indians 10%. You don't have the bulk. And in these both communities, there will be pockets of people who are self-interested. So they will vote <coughs> according to their self-interest. It's the same in Singapore. 75, 76, 78% Chinese. If the Chinese do not vote for change, there's no change. So I think it's important for me, at least the way I see Southeast Asian politics, I always bring the Chinese diaspora straight into the equation because they have the power dynamic. They have the money to fund the politics. So I don't see it. You know, even Myanmar, you have to see the, the role of the diaspora Chinese. You know, they have wealth. Anybody driving a fancy car in Yangon, better look inside. And you'll see uh, it's not your Rohingya person who's driving the fancy car. That's for sure. Yeah. So just. So is there greater political action among the Bangladeshi migrants in Malaysia and also probably you know, Singapore to a large extent thanks to Facebook and you know, other social media? I mean, I had a conversation with Bangladesh uh, migrant workers in Singapore. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a period you know, I was in high profile. So I, I like the curries. You know? So I go to this uh, Bangladesh shop. I have street recognition. A couple of guys come around. You know, I'm not citizen, I'm not both. You know? But I think migrants generally want to look after their self-interest. I think it doesn't have to be skilled. Whether skilled or unskilled, they look after their self-interest. I've talked to elite bankers, foreign bankers in Singapore. It's the same. They will validate the Singapore model. They say, no, no need for change. Otherwise, the system will collapse. Mm -hmm. So, I lived in Australia for a while. Um, among my Australian colleagues, we also have this discussion about the grateful immigrant. So, it depends on under which party, you, whether it was Labour or the Conservatives. So, if you came under that wave, then you are probably grateful to that regime. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how much of it we can believe, but, you know, these are some of the discussion. So how would you vote here? Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm being naughty, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. No, no, I had a question though. Oh yeah, please, you know, please. In terms of, uh, you were mentioning echo chamber in terms of social media. Mm. Um, I was just very interested in how you would see um, you know, that sort of impacting the elections, even to the party elections, you're aware of it. Um, you know, what are the ways in which maybe the ruling party or whoever's contesting, how do they work with social media? influence or put forward their own sort of, you know, because a lot of times people, and you, know, you contest it, you're trying to work with the system in such a way that that's to your advantage. I mean, have there been things that you've done, uh, you know, personally or parties personally do to um, enhance their sort of increasing the, their voice in the echo chamber? I think they try to increase their presence on the platform. So if it's social media, Facebook, uh, in the Singapore election landscape, um, 2001, 2006, um, the ruling party was hardly present. In fact, they, they didn't want to. They, they felt there were risks. But by 2011, mm -hmm. they're on board. The Prime Minister has a Facebook page and, you know, Parties themselves, the party page is always smaller in profile. 
compared to the lead politician or the star politician page. So that's different. There may be a party fan club page, which may be bigger, that, that is sometimes not so political in its message. There could be some fun stuff, social stuff, so, so it captures uh, a larger audience. Um, but I come back ultimately to, to values. My two runs in Singapore, dealing with the Chinese electorate, and I speak some fair bit of conversational Mandarin and dialect. Um, I think the community there is not ready for political change. It's mm -hmm. also largely an immigrant community that you know pretty much self-centered. So no matter how much campaign you throw, you're not gonna. Yeah, you're not gonna crack. So you, you just yeah you, you're banging your head against the wall, right? Yeah, and it, it's also um, I mean un unless you go knock doors, you shake the ground, right? And right. shake hands and communicate. Um, you know, politics is very ethnic. Right. Yeah, the Chinese water. You know, mm, uh, although they may see me as some form of circular globalized person of Indian or South Indian origin right. maybe not so ethnocentric but still they can't bear to vote mm -hmm. yeah so any argument that you know you you so can vote words, across yeah in other words when push comes to shove mm -hmm. people just side with their ethnicity and their there's a certain interest. comfort I think there's yeah. a certain uh, comfort you, you, right. you, you know I, I'm sure I'll be t taken to task by uh, by friends and colleagues but but that's my ground experience. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's very interesting. Thank you. A couple of queries. One is that your own uh, journey as a politician and a political campaigner. And you are also your own journey as a scholar of this phenomenon and how do they interact? Secondly, in terms of a logic of segmentation, this entrenched logic of segmentation, has it remained frozen over time? Or there have been some movements? Uh, and uh, what are the possibilities of opening up uh, these enclosed segmented spaces? Mm -hmm. Maybe the constitution is one, you know, uh, and then different kind of political contestations. So in Malaysia, for example, and, and whether uh, one can explore different kind of political contestations as a way of interrogating this logic of segmentation and mm -hmm. creating certain kind of you know, border crossing, <coughs> if any. And, uh, and, and that kind of, uh, in a social media space, along with the reproduction of the logic of segmentation, if there is possibility to create uh, different uh, threads of border crossing. Mm. Mm. For me, I think, because we are looking at the elections, elections is jurisdiction, is rule bound, uh, you need to have eligibility to vote. You need to be a citizen. Uh, countries have become sophisticated, they have prerequisites that means you must be resident five years, right? Or in the last five years before the election, you must be resident for two or three years, you know? So these are demonstrable facts. Even in Singapore, I think the, 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 the prerequisite in the last five years, you must be at least resident for two years. So in, you know, just pulling, you know, Singapore and Malaysia, those who have been pushing for change, a lot of them have got disappointed and they have gone abroad. So specifically for the Chinese community, when Malaysia became independent in 1957, I think it was, um, it, the ethnic composition of the country was almost on par. It was like low 50, uh, sorry, uh, high 40s and low 40s for the Malay. And, uh, and when Malaysia joined Singapore, the Chinese population went up, and that was part of the problem why they pushed up Singapore, right? 
in the last 30 to 40 years, the out-migration of the Chinese has been tremendous. Uh, there are World Bank figures, and I've done a study of the figures. Um, several million, up to three million Chinese have left uh, Malaysia. About one million are residing in Malaysia, uh, sorry, in, in, in Australia. So if you went to Australia in the early days, not now, not in the last 10 years, all Chinese restaurants will be owned by Malaysian Chinese. Yeah, only now you have the mainlanders opening Chinese restaurants. So, so if you went to Australia and you saw Malaysian Chinese, you had chicken rice mm. or Penang noodles, you know. Remember the seminar, you know? <laughs> It's only now you have, you know, Shalom Pao and other stuff, the mainland uh, stuff that's uh, happening. 500,000 ethnic Chinese in the last 30, 40 years have migrated to Singapore. Alone. <coughs> and 80, 88, if you look at World Bank figures, 88% are ethnic Chinese. Uh, so what I'm trying to sort of you know, maybe clumsily respond to your segmentation question is to say that the 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 units that participate in the election they are not fixed, they are shifting. So there's a portion that has left the country. So the the segments are not constant; they are changing, and they are being reinforced also by uh, new citizens. So, like in any organization. Uh, countries or ruling regimes are trying to recruit new citizens and immigrants who share the same political values so so they can recreate the correct segmentation that will keep them in power and I think part of the Singapore immigration policy is guided by that that's why we have very limited voting, overseas voting. Do you know that overseas voters of Singapore have to be civil servants only? So that means those who have the right to, to undertake overseas voting, they have to be civil servants on duty, diplomats, government scholarship holders, and they can only vote um, in, I think now, 12 polling stations around the world key cities where there are you know, pockets of Singapore immigrants. This has been relaxed to include lay people as well now, and this was only over the last elections. Uh, but again, where you can vote makes it difficult. So a lot of people, you know, like in Australia, there's a lot of Singaporeans you know, who have migrated there and they have different political views. If you want to vote, you have to go to Canberra and you know, take it to Canberra from, you know, Melbourne or Adelaide or Perth is going to be very expensive. Might as well take a flight to South Africa <laughs> for a holiday. So, so I, I, you know, for me, the segmentation, you know, uh, uh, is, is kind of marked by, you know, sort of voter requirements, legal requirements, variables, and so on. Um, and people have moved out of these different segments, but some of these segments have been reconstituted by regimes, you know, who are kind of recruiting new citizens with uh, similar political values. So I think that's something to think about, you know, because uh, the assumption that your citizenry is fixed and you could, you know, educate them in democracy and therefore affect political change, I think is misguided because it's shifting, right? And then you have multiple citizenship, residencies, and stuff like that. Clumsy, but I'm. That's all I could master in response. <coughs> and about Anwar Ibrahim. Anwar Ibrahim, I think to date, uh, he's still <coughs> seen as a political icon, um, controversial, but still in a limited way able to unite the the opposition. 
and again it's ethnic politics now uh, even though Lim Kek Siang who is the leader of the you know Democratic Action Party in Malaysia even though the Chinese may be financially or have political club they will still put the Malay as the leader and Anwar's position as the leader of the opposition is informed by the ethnic politics of Malaysia <coughs> uh, and you'll come back and again to Singapore we have this debate you know um, you will see Singapore uh, put up ethnic minorities as president but without the Chinese endorsement there's no way an ethnic person can be a uh, minority can be anything right and there are debates you know they say that no non -eth no non chinese can be prime minister <coughs> because the local community the chinese community will not support it so politically problematic so i think ethnicity does play a role uh, it doesn't from straight political science, you know, methodology and so on is, is problematic, you know, to, to do correlation when you talk about ethnicity and things like that. But, uh, but it's still relevant, I think, you know, from an ethnographic or sociological point of view or from a qualitative point of view, you know, uh, people still raise this as an important issue. By many, by many, you know, not many, a couple of rounds uh, <coughs> of trying to come into power, which I failed. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's rationality, policies, good for sound bites, good to convince people who want to intellectualize the process and who need inter intellectualization, you know? Um, you see, I'll give you an example when I was in NUS. This is going way back. And I was running for student union president. I think it must be your days, John. He's embarrassed right now. <laughs> and, uh, and even student politics is ethnically shaped. And I remember... Um, see, I, I, I don't play the ethnic card because, you know, I, Brought up in Singapore, I don't see myself as an Indian, you know, I just see myself as a Singaporean. At least until the naive period of running for student body elections in Singapore, yeah, at the National University of Singapore. And I had a, a certain disquiet. I remember the, there was some anti-James Gomez sentiment among some students, among Chinese students and so on. So one of my Indian friends came to me and said, did you go and campaign with the Indian Cultural Society? I said, no, I, I don't like all that. He said, you better go, I think we need it. <laughs> so I know where they hang around in the canteen. So I went to see the leader. I said, hey, you know, I'm Jay. Yeah, we know, we know. So I said, today is elections, can you help? Don't worry, we'll be there. And I remember, you know, we were doing some kind of straw counting about who's voted for us, and it didn't look good for me. It was uh, voting closets at 5. At about 4.45, in the distance, I saw a dark crowd. Whoa, we won. Because <laughs> they all came, 30 of them, and voted. So that's, you know. That's the Indian card. That's right, yeah. I'm proud to be here. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, I'll be proud. Yeah. Sorry, I, I'm just being naughty. <laughs> it's only water. So. so, is there any other question? Mm -hmm. It's okay, then we should wrap up. The yes, topic. yes, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, thanks for the uh, conversation. Yeah. So okay, well, thank you so much for visiting us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah.